today we look at some examples of classic clarity in terms of who is the antagonist set up early and clearly. We'll talk about how these relationships are essentially relative. Uh, we'll see how it's sometimes an issue or a challenge to identify who is the antagonist. Sometimes they're just fine, charming characters, and some of those are fine uh, are also false mentors. We'll talk about the shadow. We've done that in our hero's journey class. We'll do that again today. We'll come back uh, with a few more examples of strong shadow characters, and we'll see how that is metaphorically expressed on the screen. Villains are humans too, and we'll see how we can humanize them. And finally, we want those shadow characters to be strong and resourceful and have we want them to have purpose and um, a clear plan. So let's start with these simple antagonists that are set up early and it, there is absolutely no doubt uh, about what their, what their intentions are. We, it's very clear early on that these are going to be the, the challenge for our hero. This is from the movie Speed. And it is right at the start. Hey, this area is restricted. Oh, hi. Yeah, I know. They call me down here. Some of this wiring got screwed up. Nobody called it down to me. I'm going to have to see a work order. Yeah, just a second. There you are. <laughs> Nothing personal. Dennis Hopper does that so well. Here he is the uh, villain in Speed. Very early in the film he's being set up. And um, yeah, he, he doesn't really change. But we see that he's got a plan and his plan becomes clearer as the story progresses. Also, from right in the start, the start of the film, this is from Terminator, introduction of, I think it's the T-1000. Now, there's something interesting about this character because from the, the scene that follows this one, it might appear that he's not necessarily um, of evil intent. That's when he deals with a few hooligans. The music obviously underscores that something is afoot. And then the opening of The Untouchables in which Al Capone is introduced, but from a quite human perspective. We see him uh, at the barbers, surrounded by journalists, and he looks like in, a, you know, a fellow that you can reason with. An article which I believe appeared in a newspaper asked why, since you are, or it would seem that you are, in effect, the mayor of Chicago, you've not simply been appointed to that position. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, it's touching. Like a lot of things in life, we laugh because it's funny and we laugh because it's true. Some people say, reformers here say, put that man in jail. What does he think he is doing? Uh, what I hope I'm doing, and here's where your English paper's got a point, is I'm responding to the will of the people. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't seem all that bad a guy uh, early in the film yet. And one of the functions of this scene might be that clearly he has support. There are people who are not uh, convinced that he should be put in jail. We're going to Gruber. Gruber, one of the classic villains in movies. With him, it is clear that he's up to no good early in the early in the film. But we don't get a good feel of what sort of character he is until a little bit later. So this is the first time we see him in the film.
What's remarkable about some of these characters is that they, they're actually fine characters. You know, the, uh, Gruber is uh, distinguished, educated, charming. Capone in The Untouchables as well. I mean, he's a, a lover of the arts. We see him towards the end of Act Two in the opera, which is his favorite pastime. So some of these antagonists show sophistication. And Gruber is probably one of those that, um, you know, takes this to the extreme. In this scene, he is terrifying. The next scene that I'm showing you, he's terrifying. But at the same time, he's eloquent and he's smart and he's got a pretty good memory. Now, where is now. Mr. Tuck Tuck? Where is Mr. Tuck Tuck? Joseph Yoshinobu Takagi. Joseph Yoshinobu Takagi. Born Kyoto, 1937. Born Kyoto, 1937. Family emigrated to San Pedro, California. Family emigrated to San Pedro, California. Interned at Manzanar, 1942. Interned at Manzanar, 1942. Scholarship student, University of California. Scholarship student, University of California. 1955. Law degree, Stanford. Law degree, 62. <laughs> MBA, Harvard. 1970. MBA, Harvard. President Nakatomi Trading. President Vice Chairman Nakatomi Investment Group. Vice Chairman Nakatomi Investment Group. And father of five. And father I am to of five. I am to How do you do? So how do you do? He keeps his manners throughout uh, and um, within minutes after this scene he will um, cold-bloodedly execute uh, this, this man, Takagi. His language, the style of his speech gives away his education and um, a similar sort of approach we can see with Agent Smith in The Matrix. Uh, again, a, a man who expresses himself very articulately. search running agent smith from um, the matrix and then obviously the ultimate in education and sophistication this man hannibal lecter um, and this is the first encounter this is when clarice sterling meets him for the first time <laughs> Director, my name is Clarice Starling. May I speak with you? You're one of Jack Crawford's, aren't you? I am, yes. May I see your credentials? Certainly. Closer, please. Closer. That expires in one week. So obviously we could argue about whether he is the antagonist in this film because the Silence of the Lambs is about Clarice Sterling's hunt for Buffalo Bill and um, like there is some sort of a, a mentor in that hunt. But we'll, we'll have that discussion in a minute and I think it's, it's pretty clear that from their relationship there is, there is some uh, shadow uh, kind of you know, bond between them. And what that means, we'll talk about in a minute. In terms of dis being distinguished and sophisticated, here's another extreme. In um, the movie The Queen, we have Tony Blair opposite his antagonist in that particular story, and that's the Queen of England. 
you like to sit there, Mrs. Blair? you again, Mr. Blair. And congratulations. Thank you. Oh, children must be very proud. Well, I hope so. You've three, haven't you? That's right. Oh, how lovely. Such a blessing, children. Uh, please do sit down. Thank you. Yeah, she... She looks like a lovely person, but later in the story, we'll see that she's a formidable opponent. And um, in fact, in order to give our main character, um, uh, Tony Blair, in this film, uh, a, a more gravitas himself, it appears that uh, Peter Morgan, when he was writing the story, he built up the, the strength and the power of this antagonist. And that, that made his main character more active and more purposeful so that is it's a technique you can use in order to beef up your protagonist you just strengthen your antagonist make your antagonist more purposeful sometimes these antagonists come initially come across as innocent and, and positive and, and allies of your hero and a really good example is annie wilkes in misery I'm your number one fan. There is nothing to worry about. You're going to be just fine. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. Where? We're just outside Silver Creek. You've been here two days. You're going to be okay. So this is um, Annie Wilkes, the character in uh, Misery. And uh, James Kahn plays the novelist, the author, uh, Paul Sheldon. And he was planning on finishing his series about the Misery character. And then uh, Annie becomes his muse as he is forced to continue the series and keep writing. Now, as you see her at the beginning of the film, she's just a lovely lady and she comes at the right time to save our hero. And very often the greatest antagonists are introduced in that way. They're, they're characters who seem to have only positive attributes. It's, it's hard to see what's wrong with them early. In. And often they're, they're even mentors. They're literal mentors to our heroes. And one classic example of a mentor character who then develops, transforms into the shadow is in the movie um, Training Day. So a story of a, a rookie cop joining the force, uh, played by Ethan Hawke, and he's put against the character played by Denzel Washington, who introduces him into the ways of um, yeah, this um, rather sinister character. And they will be antagonists later in the game. Kind of similar to many other films. One that I think referenced, uh, I referenced here recently, uh, L.A. Confidential. Similar where um, also an, a rookie cop joins the team and then ultimately finds himself opposite his mentor. So that notion of the mentor becoming the villain, the shadow, you will find in many films. And it's, a, it's a, quite a strong transformation a good example is avatar in which we see jake initially meet with his colonel his colonel, colonel who teaches him the ropes and tells him what life is going to be like on pandora want to see me colonel there's low gravity will make you soft you get soft pandora will shit you out dead with zero warning I pulled your record, Corporal. Venezuela, that was some mean bush. Nothing like this here, though. You got some hard kids showing up in this neighborhood. Figured it's just another hellhole. I was first recon myself. 
few years ahead of you. Well, maybe more than a few. Three tours in Nigeria, not a scratch. I come out here, day one. Think I felt like a shaved tail, Louie? Yeah. Well, they could fix me up. Remember this one from a few weeks back? I think it might have been our last round of master classes. Uh, Pixar loves this a lot, this notion of the mentor character that later turns into the shadow. At this point of, of the story in Monsters, Inc., the character of Water News is the mentor. He's helping the monsters to become good scarers. There's nothing more toxic or deadly than a human child. A single touch could kill you. Leave a door open and a child could walk right into this factory, right into the monster world. I won't go in a kid's room. You can't make me. <laughs> You're going in there because we need this. And a more recent uh, example of a Pixar mentor turning villain was in Toy Story 3 with Lotso Bear. Well, hello there. I thought I heard new voices. Welcome to Sunnyside, folks. I'm Lotso Hugging Bear, but please call me Lotso. Buzz Lightyear, we come in pool. <laughs> First thing you gotta know about me, I'm a hugger. <laughs> oh, look at you all. You've been through a lot today, haven't you? Oh, it's been horrible. Well, you're safe now. We're all cast-offs here. We've been dumped, donated, yard sales, second-handed, and just plain thrown out. But just you wait. You'll find being donated was the best thing that ever happened to you. The irony of that line is that it's exactly what Woody will learn at the end of this film. So the, the shadow character, the villain, tells him what he needs to learn. Being donated will be the best thing that ever happened to him. And, and he will take... Uh, that advice. So this is a good example of a shadow who needs to be killed, defeated in order to be embraced. And um, when, when we talk about the shadow, I'll go into this in more detail. Now, there, there are two aspects of Lotso Bear that I found interesting when he's introduced. And just before this clip, literally seconds before this clip, he, he arrives in this truck, but with his back towards us, as if he's got something to hide. So he's not showing his his real face initially, right? So he, he, he arrives in this room in the truck, but we see his back before then the truck reverses and we see his face. And in the hug with uh, Buzz, it was striking how strong he is. So it shows his power, his, his physical power. And those are uh, plans to set up for what would happen later. Now, an interesting aspect of this character, Lotso Bear, fluffy and friendly and smelling like strawberries um, is that when he turns to the dark side in this film we see why that is we we see why he became and how he became who he is today and i'm talking about the wound so the the wound that happened in the past of this character what's often kept in backstory and not shown it is effectively shown in this film at the midpoint reversal it is a flashback told through the eyes of a um, supporting character called Chuckles. I was there when Lotso got unwrapped. Daisy loved us all, but Lotso, Lotso was special. They did everything together. you never seen a kid in a toy more in love. One day we took a drive. Hit a rest stop, had a little playtime. After lunch, Daisy fell asleep. She never came back. It's not standard for uh, villains or antagonists, shadow characters, to um, to be you know, introduced through their wound or to be shown uh, where they come from. But when it happens, it actually adds texture, it adds depth to the character, and sometimes it helps uh, to humanize them. Not always.
very much. Well, what do we have here? All for you. Janie, isn't that a beautiful doll? Thank you, young man. That's a gorgeous doll. Folks, have you ever seen such a lovely doll? <laughs> All right, children. Thank you. Thank you. Now, now, folks, folks, please, please, don't, don't forget, there's a genuine Baby Jane doll waiting for each and every one of you right out in the foyer. All you have to do is to go out there and collect her. And kids, remember, you can tell your moms that each and every one of these genuine, beautiful, great big dolls is an exact replica of your own Baby Jane Hudson. Thank you. Baby Jane dolls are in a tree in the corner. Here they are, very beautiful. Natural hair. Come in. Baby Jane Doll, for the 325. Bye, folks. I don't want to go back to the old hotel. I don't have to take a nap, and you can't make me. Now, Jane, don't act up, sweetheart. You've got to take your nap. You know that. No, I don't know, and I'm not going to. Well, that's... Now, Janie, you don't want all these nice friends of yours out here to think that you're a bad little girl now, do you? So the only purpose of this prologue is really setting up and, and uh, clarifying why the main character or the, sorry, the antagonist character of whatever happened to baby Jane behaves as she does when we go into the main story. And as I said there, she was played by uh, Betty Davis opposite Joan Crawford. Oh, Jane, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to ring for my breakfast. I was just wondering who all those people were at the back door. It wasn't anything. Just that nosy Mrs. Bates going on about your picture last night. Oh, really? Did she like it? Oh, really? Did she like it? She liked it. I remember when it first came out, it had a tremendous reception. The critics described it as brilliant. Do you remember what year you made that picture? But of course, you must too, 1934, right after I did Moonglow. I made a picture that year too. Oh yes, it was that comedy directed by Lloyd, wasn't it? No, it wasn't, it was a love story. The Longest Night. Martin McDonald said it was the best thing I ever did. <laughs> yeah, and obviously the uh, cinema history uh, has told us that the, the characters in, in the real world, uh, the actresses were quite uh, the opposite from their roles in this film. And Joan Crawford was far more the Baby Jane type of character than, than Betty Davis. Um, yeah, we're halfway and I want to see how you guys are going, whether there's any questions or thoughts that you'd like to add to this. Um, with antagonists, I got around to thinking about a little bit about Avatar and things like Watership Down where... Um, like humanity is the antagonist or Lord of the Rings where the industrial revolution is the antagonist or society and into the wild. Is that, is that treated differently as, um, is that an antagonistic force? I know we're talking about character at the moment, but where does that play into, is it a representation yeah. of the character as a bigger antagonist? No, I think um, we've got to look into the specifics of the titles you've just mentioned because some of these you're actually talking about the theme rather than the story and the characters um in lord of the rings i think uh, it, it is you know you can identify clear antagonists on the screen and that's you know saruman with the, and, and the orcs there's, there's always a clear antagonist that um, um frodo is facing and at some point, it even becomes his, uh, his best friend. So there, there are clear um, f uh, antagonists that are not faceless. And you can argue that obviously, thematically, the, the story can be about uh, an antagonist in the real world that this story is about. Now, when you're telling stories, whatever shape or form you want to bring them in, um, the whole purpose of telling a story is to give faces to faceless notions. That's exactly why we create archetypal characters. That's why we externalize emotions, we externalize conflict, and we, we design antagonist characters 
for our heroes to be able to directly interact with notions that in the real world may be abstract. And that is not interesting. You can't really bring that uh, on the screen in an interesting way. Now, one of the films you did mention, um, uh, Into the Wild, you could say that there is, there is no character. There is no person who's up against our hero. And he is, he's indeed up against the elements. Now, Into the Wild, I think, is a, uh, is a really, really successful film in what it, it tried to achieve, but it was not a mainstream film. Um, um, something I'll, I'll bring up later in this discussion is how we can veer off the path of what is considered mainstream, provided we stick to a certain other uh, number of um, qualities and, and stakes is one of those. So in Into the Wild, we have the stakes rising and rising. Ultimately, it's, it's a life or death stake. Um, so all those, those elements play, but I think it is critical that before answering your question, we really need to distinguish between uh, the, the thematic antagonists, the antagonists in the real world that are not necessarily in the story, and then the, the character antagonists in the story that mostly do have faces. You could also argue uh, or, or ask, could an antagonist be an object? Um, and then my answer would be no. You, you would create a character to represent that object. And in animation, yes, you can have an object that fulfills a certain role, but often they are um, anthropomorphized, so they, they are being given human shape. It's That's a very long-winded yeah, answer. A bit like Rangers of the Lost Ark. Lost start with the, the Ark of the Covenant, but then there's a human... Precisely, and, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and for, for more is the... Yeah, yeah. Pr precisely. So the so there is so there's a character to interact with. And, you know, think about it in the real world. If, you know, you get your, your text letter and you're angry, uh, you need someone to be angry against. You know, this, it doesn't really have. It doesn't really work to be angry against a letter because the letter is not responding. To make that interesting and dramatic, you want to put a character in the scene. So you want to create a character so the, 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 our hero can vent their emotions, and you can play with that. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, I have one about um, mystery films. So obviously, those films have. Have have twists where one person is revealed to be the true antagonist, but you know, is it important to to set up m multiple characters as possible antagonists for the review to work? I think that comes down to um, two two criteria primarily. One is what's the genre of your film, and secondly, what is, what are the requirements of your particular story? When you have a mystery. Um, yes, we, you know, you need to set up multiple candidates for the antagonist and, and often it's only revealed very, very late. So who done it, uh, like a mystery, same, same deal. You can keep that um, confusion, the doubt, the guessing, you can keep that going for quite a while. Now, usually people don't like that quite as much as having a clear antagonist. Why is that? Because we want to be able to uh, feel emotions and express emotions and if we don't know who the character is it's hard to express those emotions so as, as soon as an antagonist is clear w the emotions will usually be greater and and um, uh, mystery is not as strong an emotion as fear and once the antagonist is known you can play with that fear um, in a different way now you could argue well you know Fear of the unknown, you know, in Alien, before the, we see the alien monster, there is fear because things are going on. The jaws, before the, the, the shark hits the screen, there is fear because we know there is danger out there. So it depends on the genre, it depends on the genre and the type of film. In a minute, I'll, I'll have a few examples of films that break these rules, break them very effectively. Um, but again, it is not always without risk. These are, you know, are sometimes... Um, you decide that in order to tell your story the way you want it, there's no other way but to break those rules and not show an antagonist. Um, can you hear me or no? Yes. I don't have my sound on. Can hear you. Okay. I just really like Glenn Close, um, in the movie where she's the bunny boiler. Well, yeah, Fatal Attraction. Restrained. Faye, I was thinking about Faye Dunaway in um, Mummy Dearest. 
and how over the top she was. Very scary, very out of control, terrifying performance. But Glenn Close's performance was equally as terrifying, showing even just a fraction of what the potential that she had. It's just interesting. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great suggestion. I mean, keep those suggestions coming because, as I said, it's the first time I'm running this particular class and I'd love to take on your suggestions for, uh, for examples and clips. So then there is that question, who is the, the antagonist and how do we identify them? It's not always clear. Guys. You're such an asshole. Come on, come on, that was funny. No, it wasn't. You got nothing to worry about, Allie. It's just me. You totally freaked me out. You know, you can drop the act now. What act? Like you're better than everyone else. I don't think... Yeah, you do. But that's okay, Allie, because I get it. Come on, Allie, come on. This is uh, from... One of my favorite comedies called uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evils. Any of you seen it? No. It's a story, it's, you know, the classic horror story. A bunch of kids go into the woods and they bump into uh, 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 a couple of hillbillies and s suddenly everybody starts dying. But it's not what you think it is. It's comedy, so it's all subverted. And um, unfortunately, I actually played the wrong clip from that movie. I wanted to show you a different one. I want to show you this one. It doesn't end well for the kid, but it doesn't end the way you think it would. He's actually, as he's running, he's being impaled <laughs> on a branch. <laughs> so the, yeah, the chainsaw is, is innocent. Um, so this is one of the, the hillbillies who is perceived as one of the monsters uh, by the kids. But then at the end, we learn that the true monster is the, the one we saw with the girl. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really well done in the course of the film. It leaves us guessing, you know, <laughs> not only where is, this, where is this going, but who is the true um, antagonist in this film? This is from Toy Story 2. Um, we see Woody and the back of the collector. At this point, we see that Woody is going to be taken by the collector. It looks as if he might be the villain. Original hand-painted face, natural dyed blanket, stitched vest. Hmm, a little rip, fixable. Oh, if only you had your hand-stitched polyvinyl <gasps> hat! I found them! I found them! Buster! Quiet down! Excuse me, can I help you? Uh, yes, you can help take his paws uh, off my pal. I'll give you uh, 50 cents for all this junk. Oh, now, how did this get down Just enter here? the sheriff, oh. nice and easy. Oh, very well. I'm sorry, it's an old family toy. No! Now just walk away. Later in this film, we'll realize that the collector is quite innocent uh, and the real antagonist will be the prospector, who's a toy. Um, I had that clip, but I don't... Um, well, we may be able to get there. We'll see if we, uh, we have the time. This is a shot from one of my favorite movies by Taylor Sheridan, a writer and also director of... Sicario, uh, Wind River, Hell or High Water, and the TV series Yellowstone. In Sicario, which was his first feature screenplay, we um, follow the character of Kate, played by Emily Blunt, who is an FBI agent taken on a covert uh, black op, an inter, uh, inter um, uh, what do you call it, uh, agency operation where they go into Mexico to kidnap pretty much um, a, a, a relative of a crime lord and bring them into the US. 
And it, it's not clear who is really the antagonist here. We observe the whole story from the eyes of our protagonist, who's very passive, by the way. But it seems initially that the character we meet on the tarmac at the airport uh, near this uh, private jet uh, may be the antagonist because he represents a lot of values that our hero does not subscribe to. flies around in private jets, huh? Yeah, you guys don't have one of these? Right. Is there any food on this flight? Yeah, some bitchin' peanuts in the back. But it's kind of a self-serve deal. And then appears the Sicario, the hitman. Twice before. Played by Benicio del Toro. You know it. Keep me going to El Paso, right? Yeah, I've been to Juarez before. Okay. Uh, no, we're going to El Paso, right? Yeah. So Benicio del Toro's character here has a bit of a shady role. We don't really know what, why he's there uh, until much later in the story when he essentially becomes the shadow, when he becomes the antagonist. And uh, it's not until the very final scene that he's essentially confronted with the, with the hero. Uh, a similar sort of confusion and late identification of the hero uh, happens in the next film by Taylor Sheridan that he directed himself called Wind River, which is a story of um, uh, this hunter who kills predators for ranchers, for, for uh, farmers on the border with uh, the res reservation, the border with Canada. And he, again, he's an observer here. He's not in the situation when the first antagonists present themselves. And then again, the, the, the actual perpetrator of the crime will not be identified until very late in the game. And then it will be clear, then it will be uh, here, our hero up against that rapist. Sorry, what's the movie called again, Carell? It's Wind River. So did, uh, did something happen to him? You know where he is? That's what we're trying to find out. His girlfriend filed a missing persons report. Well, how can that be? I thought you guys found her in a snowdrift right before the storm. Excuse me? Well, I heard her name go out over the radio when you guys found her. I don't remember using her name. <laughs> Maybe you weren't listening. The fuck are you doing? What? Why are you flanking me? What are you talking about? The fuck do you think I'm talking about? You got us on three sides. Get your hand off that weapon. This is private property. Don't you fucking gun down! Put the fucking gun down right now! Put it down! Yell it! Drop your knees right now! Yell it! Turn away from me! Drop your knees right now! Fuck you! This is Department of Energy lease on reservation land, asshole! You're breaking the law by being here! Hey! This is lease land on a reservation, deputy! You've got no authority! You think I don't know what you're doing? Fucking do it, asshole! See what happens! Okay, hey, white boy, let's go! What are we doing? Deputy, you've got no authority. You're in violation of federal law. Lower your weapon. Fuck you. You got us in a crossfire. Talk to me. What do I do? Hold your ground. County sheriffs have no authority. All right, everybody. Just take it easy. FBI. Hey, FBI. This is federal land, and I am the only authority. Elizabeth Olsen as the FBI agent in what I think is an amazing film. Jeremy Renner is the hero, but he's not around when these when this happens, <laughs> the, the, the most suspenseful scene of the whole film. Um, he's only observing, and, but he takes over and he finishes the job at the end in the third act. And then the third film by the same writer, uh, Taylor Sheridan, this one uh, directed by David McKenzie, is Hell or High Water, in which, again, it's unclear who is the protagonist, who's the antagonist. It's a story of two brothers, bank robbers, and um, after we see them successfully rob the first two banks in the movie, um, then we're introduced to Jeff Bridges and his partner, and we assume that he will be the antagonist, right? You hear about these bank robberies? 
Well, you're always dressed like me. This is our uniform. We ain't got no uniform. You can wear whatever color shirt you choose. You just keep choosing mine. Ranger Rex say white, blue, or tan dress shirt. Stands the reason every once in a while we're gonna be dressed the same. Uh, well, you know what they say about imitation, Alberto. You wanna hear about these bank robberies or you just sit there and let Alzheimer's run its course? Where's that? Texas Midlands, branch in Archer City, and the branch in Olney. FBI want an assist? Midlands ain't got any branches outside Texas. Plus, they're just hitting the drawers for a few thousand. FBI don't want it. You may get to have some fun before they send you off to the rocking chair yet. So in a movie about cops and robbers, you would expect for the cops to be the good guys and the robbers to be the bad guys. However, in this film, we already uh, learned that the, one of the brothers essentially uh, needs this money and he's, he's not a, actually not a bank robber, just needs a set amount of money in order to save the farm uh, after the death of his mother so he can pass that on to his sons, otherwise they wouldn't have anything, uh, you know. So, you know, he's got, a, he's got a strong motivation and we've already empathized and identified with those guys. So now we get to learn, uh, we get to know the, this, this sheriff and we get to like him as well. So there's four characters that are vying for our sympathy and, and our empathy. And it's not clear. There's no clear antagonist. And at the end of the film, uh, we want them all to be successful, which obviously will never, never happen. There are other films in which confusion happens throughout. Um, the Psycho, we have very clear protagonists in the beginning. Then we have a fairly clear antagonist. Well, actually, we only know it once we know what the, what the antagonist does. But when the protagonist disappears, our antagonist becomes the protagonist for a limited period of time. And again, we've got a, a lovable, uh, charming young man come in who would be a perfect protagonist if he weren't a psycho. Gee, I'm sorry I didn't hear you in all this rain. Go ahead in, please. Dirty night. Can you have a vacancy? No, we have 12 vacancies. 12 cabins, 12 vacancies. They, uh, they moved away the highway. Oh, I thought I'd gotten off the main road. I knew you must have. Nobody ever stops here anymore unless they've done that. But there's no sense dwelling on our losses. We just keep on lighting the lights and following the formalities. Your home address. Oh, just the town will do. Los Angeles. Yeah, I do have, I have lost my second camera here. Anyway, so um, the question here is, so once um, uh, Marion Crane is no more, do we accept Norman Bates as the hero? Well, we do for a limited period of time. Then the, the sister comes in and the detective, and then the point of view shifts again, and our um, psycho becomes the antagonist again. And that is conf confirmed in the final image that we see in a minute. Another film in which we had a similar sort of question, who is the true antagonist is Get Out, horror film by Jordan Peele that really put him on the map as a writer, director, very, very strong film about uh, the black character, Chris, who is going to be introduced to his future in-laws who are white, but they don't know, uh, they, the, his girlfriend hasn't told her parents that he's black and so there's, there's quite a bit of tension around it then things if you have seen the film things get a bit out of control <laughs> understatement of the year and um, he needs to get out at some point he's introduced to the mother who has um, uh, hypnotic powers and it towards the end of the film it's kind of unclear who's the true antagonist. This is the mother because she has the greatest power over our, over our hero, or is it his girlfriend who has betrayed him from the very start? And then um, th this scene kind of shows that uh, dichotomy between those two characters. 
You know I can't give you the keys, right, babe? Is he hurt? Did you see him drop? Yes, I did. Jeremy, grab his legs. Please take him downstairs, Dean. Help him. So what happened there was the mother triggered the hypnosis by, you know, ticking the, the tea cup. And uh, so she is the one who exploits our hero's weakness. But she'll be eliminated before the girlfriend. And ultimately, it's again between him and the girlfriend, which brings me to the conclusion that the true antagonist here is the one who, who you know, remains standing the last. Similar to Norman Bates, because the final shot of Psycho shows that to us. It's sad when a mother has to speak the words that condemn her own son, but I couldn't allow them to believe that I would commit murder. They'll put him away now, as I should have, years ago. He was always bad. And in the end, he intended to tell them I killed those girls and that man. As if I could do anything except just sit and stare, like one of his stuffed birds. Oh, they know I can't even move a finger, and I won't. I'll just sit here and be quiet, just in case they do suspect me. They're probably watching me. Well, let them. Let them see what kind of a person I am. I'm not even gonna swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. So we skip straight to the third man. The third man who's known for his shadows, the Carol Reed directed film with Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. This is halfway the film where um, Holly, the lead, has just visited the girlfriend of uh, Harry Lyme, who is his best friend, who was supposed to be killed. Um, and there's a lot of mystery around Harry. And Harry wasn't the good man that Holly thought he was. And then he meets with him exactly halfway the story. And he appears literally out of the shadows in this sequence. Why do you think you are, Satchel Foot? What are you tailing me for? Cat got your tongue? Come on out. Come out, come out, whoever you are. Step out in the light and let's have a look at you. Who's your boss? So that's that classic shot from the third man, literally in the shadows there, the shadow of the story, Harry Lyme. Um, I'm not sure if it's coincidence or intentional, but Pixar had their hero, their uh, shadow rather, the, the antagonist character, also step out of the shadows, not surrounded uh, by cats, but by dogs. This is up. You came here in that? Uh, yeah. In a house? A floating house? Uh. <laughs> 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 That's the darndest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> You're not after my bird, are you? <laughs> But if you need to borrow a cup of sugar, I'd be happy to oblige you! <laughs> well, well, this is all a misunderstanding. My, my dog's made a mistake. 
Wait, are you Charles Muntz? Yeah, uh, well, uh, <coughs> yes. The Charles Muntz? Adventures out there. <laughs> it's really him. <laughs> That's Charles Muntz. It is. Who's Charles Muntz? I wanted to end on one final question. Do we really need them? And it brings us back to the question Lee asked about the, um, you know, the faceless antagonists and the, you know, the, the, the institutions that can they be uh, the antagonists? Well, there are tons of films that don't have a clearly defined shadow character. If you go through the list of your favorite films, you may find a handful. So the answer is that you don't need them. It depends on the type of story you have. But if you feel that you need an antagonist or you want to create an antagonist, you better make them powerful. You make them strong, you make them resourceful. And often it, it works if we feel that they're bigger and better and stronger than our antagonist. What's also important is that they have a plan. They grow smarter throughout the story. And yesterday I mentioned the example of uh, Officer Lander in Inglorious Bastards. Gruber, in the same way, uh, keeps learning throughout uh, Die Hard and keeps getting stronger. Um, yeah, so Anthony, yeah, thank you. You gave uh, uh, the never-ending story as an example. Can you elaborate on that? The never-ending story. So there's many... Um, like baddies like the wolf, but the like, the shadow character was the nothing, which was the essence. Of, of, uh, it was the like, the embodiment of the misery in the in the real world, uh, and that was killing the world of the never ending story. Yep, gotcha. Question. One question, Corella. Um, is there a link between sort of the redemptive quality of the antagonist to the protagonist's journey? I'm thinking of like Tyler Durden and Fight Club that he's required to get the um, uh, Edward Norton character to to his redemption. Yeah, yeah, nice one. I think uh, I'd say there, there, are two, there are two options that I think are quite powerful. And, and I'm not saying this, these are the only options, but in the, in the one case, you would have the shadow character that represents a, a quality or a character flaw or character trait that our main character is suppressing. And so in order to be able to embrace that, our hero needs to kill that character. Now, the, the other alternative, obviously, is that the antagonist redeems themselves or, you know, resolve their own flaw. And in um, Ratatouille, we see that with Anton Ego, who kind of loses his ego and his arrogance in that flashback when he finds his humanity again. So that, that happens and it is possible. And I think, it, I guess, the, the killing of the shadow is the mythical approach. You know, that is the, the meaning of that is essentially um, killing the fear and embracing whatever the character has been repressing. You could make it more direct by having the character visibly change and redeem themselves on the screen. So that's a win-win. You don't need anyone. You don't need to kill anyone. And in, in Ratatouille, which is a, ki a kid's movie, that may be the, the alternate solution. Um, but it is rare. I, I think it's very rare, shadow characters that redeem themselves, because it would, it would essentially suggest that these characters are on their own journey, which is typically reserved for the hero character. So the, the hero would go through the journey and complete that journey and it's unusual for the antagonist to do that because it's not their story so to speak but more the key the key for the protagonist to redeem themselves through the antagonistic forces absolutely to lead to that revelation absolutely but absolutely i'd say that the, the antagonist makes life unbearable for the hero the hero must change otherwise they're going to die you know so the the antagonist forces that transformation so they have to the, the hero has to kill their own flaw in order to be able to live live on and then and that's why at the beginning of the story they get by they've been able to cope with this flaw but then as the antagonist comes in things are um, amplified they're ex exacerbated and now the hero must do something about it and sometimes that's on a purely you know abstract level in Die Hard you know the hero has not been able to 
interact appropriately with his wife and then Gruber comes in which seems to be out of the blue disconnected with with that character issue but it is through that experience that John McClane ultimately is capable of naming his his wife by her maiden name which is his humility and he lets go of that um, male chauvinism all right that was it as I said for this round we have had seven master classes there are two more this month they're both free so you're still very much invited to join those and I think some of you will continue the the story and the the journey past uh, this round we start again in no November with a new series of seven classes and I'm already looking forward to welcoming you guys there um, mm. if you haven't signed up for that round yet you can just send me an email or go straight to the website or send me an email so I can send you that link so next week we talk about pitching and on the 30th of October we do the second session about hero's journey structure stages the structural structural beats it'll be very much like today I'll play a lot of clips and give you a bit of commentary to guide you direct you as to where in the journey we are and what what these clips are illustrating I hope you enjoyed it today and thanks for joining us have a great weekend hoping to see you thanks, next week everybody. bye Thank you.